Okay, welcome to those of you joining us online. We're glad to have you with us this morning. I'll begin with the call to worship. May the Father's hand keep you from stumbling. The footprints of Jesus give you confidence to follow and the fire of the Spirit keep you warm and safe in your walk with God this day. Okay, we have announcements. Maybe. All right, today, June 30th, starting at 6 p.m., is the kids gig at the church. And I understand we start here at 6. Am I correct? Okay, don't forget. Any other announcements? Sandra? Thank you, Sandra. Sandra says, <clears throat> there is still time to sign up for tonight if you haven't already done that, so don't hesitate. And we'll start here at 6. Anyone else? Because you're a quiet group this morning. Okay, the preacher has an announcement. Thank you. Uh, first of all, if you are one of the actors tonight, we'd like for you to be here about 6.15, but after church, uh, down there just across my office, they've got uh, the costumes for you, and uh, Pam will help you with that. Uh, make sure you get what we, we need, you need. Uh, I Thank you. A quarter till. Take a Dutchman what he means, not what he says. Thank you. Yes, be here a little bit early so we can get out to our first scene. Okay, uh, Tina, if you'll come up here. Yes, we're so excited. This is Tina Tennyson. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, she came up to me and says, I want to be baptized. So we sat down and we visited about it and we decided we'd do it today. And this was her decision. And we're grateful for that. Uh, and uh, certainly our baptism is based on our faith in Jesus Christ. And let me ask you that question. We ask each person, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes. And would you repeat that for these folk here? I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. God bless you. And we pray that this would be a uh, lifelong walk with him. Yes. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we ask your blessings right now upon Tina. Lord, as she makes this decision, and uh, Lord, we're grateful for it and her love for you. And Lord, I pray that this would be a beginning of a great relationship and walking with you and knowing you better. And Lord, we just pray that each one of us might have that desire to be what you would have us to be. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, go on back. Yes. Yeah. And I want to just make a few remarks about baptism here while we're, she's getting prepared. Um, in the Great Commission, in Matthew chapter 28, as Jesus gives his disciples that final word before he leaves, he says, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. The emphasis in the original is make disciples. Who do we baptize? I believe the scripture teaches we baptize those who want to be a disciple of Jesus. A disciple was a learner, a follower. So if you want to be a learner, a follower of Jesus, the next step is to be baptized as you follow him. I like what he says in Galatians, many of you were baptized into Christ, 
have put on Christ. Or some translations say, as many of you have been baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. In other words, coming into that relationship with him. And then there's that great passage in Romans chapter 6 where he says that uh, we've been buried with him in baptism to rise to walk in a newness of life. It's the, the, the picture of us being baptized into Christ's death and being raised to walk uh, in his life and we're reenacting the death, burial, and resurrection in our own life, making it real for us. And so if you've not made that step, we invite you to talk. Uh, we'd love to do that. Uh, uh, I, I know churches where, you know, baptism is preached every Sunday. And 98% uh, of the congregation has been baptized. So I figure that, uh, you know, we, we won't harp on that. But I just want you to know that is important. Uh, at this time, Shelly's going to come and play for us. Uh, would you help me welcome Shelly Craven to the piano? <laughs> no pressure. And so, so since we need you know, a little bit of time, you're going to play it once in English, once in Spanish, and once in French, right? <laughs> Uh, just a bit. Um, Tina, because of your confession of faith that you believe Jesus is a Christ, we now baptize you into Christ.
again upon your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Pray with you in baptism. I to walk in the newness of life. In Acts 2, verses 37 through 41, it says, And Peter said and the, to the rest of the disciples, excuse me, now when they heard what they were cut, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exalt them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we rejoice today that Tina has made this decision and been baptized. And we praise you that you sent your Son, that we might have eternal life if we believe in him. We ask that you be with those that we've mentioned earlier that are ill or are recovering from surgeries. And be with those that are traveling at this time and bring them safely back to us. We ask that you guide and direct us in all that we say and do and that we might show our love that you have given us to others. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to ask you to go ahead and stand if you would at this time. We're going to sing a few songs. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. When the shadows of this life have grown, I'll fly away. Like a bird from prison bars have flown, I'll fly away. I'll fly away. Oh, glory, I'll fly away When I die, hallelujah, by and by I'll fly away Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away To a land where joy shall never end I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away, when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. All right, man, it's great to see everybody today. This, uh, this next song is called Forever Rain. And uh, I don't know. I just, 
I think it's a cool song, and and look at Tina, huh? There she is. Yay, Tina. <laughs> <coughs> You are good, you are good When there's nothing good in me You are love, you are love On display for all to see You are light, you are light When the darkness closes in You are hope, you are hope You have covered all my sin You are peace, you are peace When my fear is crippling You are true, you are true Even in my wandering You are joy, you are joy You're the reason that I sing You are life, you are life In you death has lost its sting And no, oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. You are more, you are more than my words will ever say you are lord you are lord all creation will proclaim you are here you are here in your presence i'm made whole you are god you are god of all else i'm letting go Oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. My heart will sing no other name jesus jesus my heart will sing no other name jesus jesus my heart will sing no other name jesus Jesus, my heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares your embrace light of the world forever reign all right we're going to go ahead and invite you to be seated and be comfortable <clears throat> didn't know how long it would take wayne to uh, come back out um so so we do have one more song and uh it's just, uh, it's a newer song, it's a contemporary song, if you will, <coughs> uh, but it says, Who You Say I Am. And kind of the cool thing about this song is um, today, Tina, you witnessed her baptism, but today, if she sings this song, and I think she will, um, she gets to sing it legit. Because today, she is truly a child of God. And that's what this song is all about. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? 
I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I am. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. To know that we have a Heavenly Father who loves us, who's made provision for us, who cares for us. We're grateful today for uh, Tina's decision. We're grateful her family can be here. We're grateful for your, for your presence among us. Father, we live in a broken world. A world that is filled with um, hate. May we spread your love. In a world filled with war, may we spread your peace. In a world filled with sin, May we help them find forgiveness. Today, as we look at your word, may your word speak to our hearts. And now we pray as your son taught us to pray. Our Father, and in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our children may go to children's church at this time. As I reflected on our text for this morning, which we'll get to in a few minutes, I really felt the thrust was finding faith in strange places, in unexpected places, in unusual places. 
And so my research, the first thing that came up was um, Phil Yancey's book on finding God in unexpected places. And here's kind of a thumbnail sketch. They give you the book. And if you want to read the book, I've got it on my shelf, okay? It says, finding God in unexpected places takes the readers from ground zero to the Horn of Africa and on each stop along the way reveals footprints of God. Touches of his truth and grace that prompt the readers to search deep, deeper within their own lives for glimpses of transcendence. And then they add, the traces of God can be found in most unexpected places. An Atlanta slum, a pod of whales off the coast of Alaska, prisons in Peru and Chile, the place of Shakespeare, a health club in Chicago, and yet many Christians have not only missed seeing God, they've overlooked the opportunities to make him visible to those in most need of hope. And then I found this article by Carolyn Skinner entitled, Finding God in Unexpected Places. I didn't think this was the sort of place I'd meet a Christian. So this is a fairly regular phrase I hear as our teams as third space ministries go about sharing God in third spaces of society. Places outside the home and work. Places such as gyms and nightclubs and pubs and cafes. I love it where people are least likely to expect an encounter with God whether it's in the middle of Wimpleton or the streets of Isba or a nightclub. Our, our club angels who volunteer in nightclubs sometimes find clubbers who are almost running away from God. They're somewhat surprised to discover a Christian showing them love and offering them prayer in a place where they thought they had escaped. Jesus was criticized for hanging out with the wrong people in the wrong places and that is how lives are transformed. I believe we shouldn't shy away from sharing, seeking to share our faith and the love of God in places that might be unusual or surprising. Places that are the smelliest and the dirtiest and obscene environments. That's where I find the presence of God almost palatable and the spiritual hunger immense. So many people are not coming to our church buildings because uh, of all sorts of reasons, yet they are spiritually hungry and searching. So it's important we go where they are and meet them on the ground, their ground, and begin to sow seeds of the good news. And then I found this devotion by Greg Glory entitled Faith in Unexpected Places. He said God can do what he wants, where he wants, with whomever he chooses. But I find it interesting how God chooses to do his work through people. He could have sovereignly parted the Red Sea without Moses playing any role, but instead he told Moses, pick up your staff and raise your hand over the Red Sea and divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. God could have brought down fire from heaven without Elijah, but he directed the prophet to pray and the fire came down. Jesus could have healed everybody during his earthly ministry. He didn't have to lay hands on one person and speak the word to another. He could have simply said on the count of three, everyone is healed. One, two, three, boom, and they all would have been healed. Instead, Jesus worked in the lives of people who called out to him and applied their faith. I think of Bartimaeus, who was blind. He heard that Jesus was coming his way, so he cried, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Some told him to be quiet, but he yelled even louder. Then Jesus commanded that Bartimaeus be brought to him, and Jesus asked, What do you want me to do for you? And he replied, I want to see. And Jesus said, Go. Your faith has healed you. Then there were those who were quieter about their faith, like the woman who reasoned that she could just touch the hem of his garment. She would be healed, and she was. And then he finishes this with these words. Faith is often found in unexpected and unusual places. It's grace, not the place that makes a person the believer. 
And then I came across this story of a missionary named Ben Staggs, who on his first visit to the Bashu people in an extremely isolated group of uh, Ethiopia, it's the Mia ter Mian territory, and on arrival his local team was uh, greeted by a guy named Kalan Kabul. And it says, we sat down and spoke a bit, explained that we'd come to talk them God talk, and describe who God is and what he's like and where he lives. And Gulan interrupt, interrupted, we must follow Christos, using the Mion name for Christ. Astonished as Christ's names had not been mentioned, Ben asked Gulan where he'd heard the name. And Gulan ex explained that Christ had appeared to him in a dream and told him that he had given Gulan his life, blood, and bones, and Gulan was to follow him. And Christ then said, in just five days, someone will come to tell you about following the path. And Ben and his team had showed up on the fifth day. Or in 2001, Alex Jandro was feeling suicidal. Her marriage had broken down. After two years of separation, the divorce papers were being drawn up. She asked her mother to watch the children so she could be alone. Her mother sensed that Jandro was in a dangerous place and suggested they go shopping. Well, Jandro had no interest and energy to shop, so she sat on the bench outside the shop, contemplating the different ways that she could end her life and stop the heartache she was feeling. A woman came and sat next to her. Are you a Christian, she asked, and Jandra said she was. And the woman said, I just want to tell you that if you're a follower of Jesus, you are more than a conqueror in him. And Jandra said, bam, those words breathed life into me, and all the thoughts of suicide left me, and God's unexplainable peace rushed in. And then she adds, my husband and I will celebrate 26 years of marriage this year. Now many of you know that I like working in prison. It's, it's kind of an uh, unexpected place to find faith. Now I know there's those who are suspicious of jailhouse faith. I understand that. But I promise you there's nothing like facing a 30-year sentence to give a person religion. And I've met some very authentic people in prison. They're very transparent. They're not wearing a mask of self-sufficiency. I remember when my daughter went with me once, her comment was, they just seem so real. Like they have nothing to hide, nothing to prove. They're just authentic and real. So this past week I received a letter from Charles, which is rather interesting because I don't, I don't remember meeting him. I'm sure I did. I know where. It had to be in prison. <laughs> And he's probably written me three letters to every one I've written him. And the funny thing was that he, they've all been going back to Grove and the secretary there had uh, told me that they'd gotten one and wanted me to forward. And I said, I'll just hang on to it. I'll be down there one day. When I got down there, he, he, he was asking me if I would be in Oklahoma City for his uh, hearing before the pardon pro board. And the date was already passed. So I had to write him a letter of apology. And he said, uh, this past week, after 42 years, the pardon pro board voted yes. He's on a 120-day step-down step stipulation to help him get adjusted to the outside world. Things have changed in the last 40 years, let me tell you. His PS simply said, 40 years of sobriety and faith. And then after that I got a letter from my friend Ken. Ken started a church in prison. I asked him when God called him to ministry and he said he called him before he went to prison. The only thing it was he was running from God then. It might have saved him a lot of heartache if he had listened to God earlier. And uh, I'd preached at his service few times and uh, I'd never looked at his rap sheet. I asked him once how long he's in for and he told me two lifetimes which means he's probably not coming back out. So before we was down there in April well 
I was showing Dina his rap sheet. It is really pretty long. I won't tell you anything about it. And he said this, on a personal level, I want to say thank you. Thank you for extending a true Christian grace towards me. I'm sure that when you saw my situation on paper, it shocked your conscience. The fact that you took time to talk to me about it and not just walk away from such a conversation shows that you truly have the love of Christ within you. As for me, there are truths and untruths in the story. However, I've taken full responsibility for my bad choices and refuse to let myself develop a victim's mentality or remain in the same mindset as before. As I've told you many times before, I am redeemed in Christ. I am a new creation. And the Lord has called me and sent me with a purpose not only to be transformed, but help to transform others through discipleship. This story is still being written. My life is not my own. I now live as I have a king submitted fully to the servant of the king of glory. Yes, you can find faith in strange places. As I read these, the thought crossed my mind. There's a difference between finding God in an unexpected place and finding faith in an unexpected place. In fact, I would say we expect to find God in unexpected places because, well, you're not going to go anywhere but what God has been there before. You're not going to go anyplace but what God is going with you. God is all present. God created the whole universe, so it's his, and yes. So my argument is, finding God in unexpected places is not unexpected. Phil Yancey writes, Jesus himself looked for God, not among the pious at the synagogue, but in a widow who had two pennies left to her name, a tax collector who knew, knew no formal prayers. He found his spiritual lessons in sparrows sold at the market, in wheat fields, in wedding banquets, yes, even in the observation of a mixed race foreigner who had five failed marriages. Jesus was a mastermind of finding God in unexpected places. But I would say there's some places where we're going to find God where we may not find faith. Where people don't recognize God or don't know him, don't believe in him. I mean, there were times in Jesus' life when he was very disappointed in the fact that people didn't have faith. You remember the storm that came? The disciples were in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. The storm came up and the waves were shaking not only the boat but the faith of the disciples. And their big question is, where's Jesus? He's sleeping. We've got to wake him up. He's got to see the storm. He calms the storm of the sea. But the storm in their heart is still raging. And he asks, you have a little faith. Why are you so afraid? That's Matthew's account, Mark's account. He said, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Do you get the picture? I like the way Howard Hendricks puts, puts this. He says, Jesus gave him a lesson on faith. And if you read the preceding passage, you find that he did. And then he took them out in the laboratory of life to give them a test. And he said they got an F. And it was not for faith. Have you been there? Have you been there? You remember another story where Jesus was not in the boat and he comes walking along and there's a storm and Peter jumps out of the boat and starts walking to him and he, on the water and he does pretty well. He starts looking at the waves and the storm around him and the circumstances and he starts to sink and Jesus reaches out and grabs him. And Jesus said, oh you have little faith, why do you doubt? <laughs> and then I'm thinking about the rest of them still in the boat. Huddled up, they don't have enough faith to get out of the boat. I think Peter did pretty well myself. You remember when Jesus was in his hometown, he said, didn't do him very many miracles there because of their lack of faith? Remember when the disciples were unable to cast out a demon out of a lad and Jesus admonished them because you have so little faith? There were times when Jesus praised people for the demonstration of faith. You remember the paralyzed man that his four friends brought him to Jesus? The house was so crowded they couldn't get in. They took him up on the roof. They tore off the shingles. They let him down. And it says when Jesus saw their faith, that's the faith the guy's up there. He said to the man, 
Son, your sins are forgiven. Before he healed his body, he healed his soul. The woman who had a menstrual bleeding for 12 years had just enough faith to touch the hem of his garment and Jesus turned to her and said, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has healed you. And she was healed at that moment. Blind Bartimaeus, Jesus said, Go, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received sight. The Canaanite woman, Jesus said, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. Your daughter was healed. Her daughter was healed at that moment. And now to our text in Luke chapter 7. When Jesus had finished all these, saying all these things to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum and there a servant, a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and some of the elders, and sent some of the elders, the Jews, to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when he came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, uh, pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this. Because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. And so Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent his friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself. For I do not, do not deserve to have you come under my roof. And that, that's why I do not even uh, consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority. With soldiers under me. I tell one to go and he goes. I tell another one to come and he comes. And I say to my servant do this and he does that. And when Jesus heard this he was amazed. And turning to the crowd following him he said. I tell you I've not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the man who had been, men who had been sent returned home and found the servant well. I want you to notice some things about this centurion. He was respected. He was not Jewish. He was Roman. Most Jews would consider him an enemy. An, part of the occupying force. He was there in the land he'd been assigned. But he was respected by the Jews. Secondly, he was a good man. He was commander of at least a hundred soldiers. He was a centurion. And the Roman soldiers in Palestine, they're part of an occupying force. And ironically, the Jewish leaders are usually at odds with Jesus. But Jesus is coming on behalf, they're coming to Jesus on behalf of this military officer of the occupying force because they say he's a good man. He's generous. He, he, he built the Jews a synagogue I was listening on YouTube the other day to a Baptist preacher and he, he said this would be like the Methodists or the Episcopalians building us a new sanctuary. I'm thinking no, it would be more like the Muslims or the Buddhists building a sanctuary for Christians. He was caring, he cared about people he was assigned to, to oversee them. And he also cared about a servant who was more than a slave. He was more like a son to him. He was humble. Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I don't deserve for you to come under my roof. I don't even consider myself worthy to come to you. He was an officer. Doesn't that uh, entail him to some uh, privileges? He doesn't like, act like a man of entitlement. He could have demanded. He understood the culture in which he lived. For a Jew to go into a Gentile's house, they'd be defiled. I don't think he wanted to bother. I don't think it would have bothered Jesus to gone into his house. But he wanted to respect Jesus' culture. You don't have to come to my house. I'm not worthy. There was a sense of awareness of the situation. He was a man of authority. He understood how he could use authority. He was under authority. He knew those under him listened to his authority. But he knew Jesus had authority. Jesus had authority. Jesus didn't have to be present. All Jesus had to do was speak the word. And it would happen. He had great faith. He had not been raised in a Jewish faith. He had not been raised in a family faith. He came from another culture, another background. I'm sure he knew little, if anything all, about the Messiah that was to come. And yet I can't help but think this was a slap in the face of the average Jew. For Jesus saying, this Gentile, this foreigner, has greater faith than they did. Israel should have been a bastion for faith and yet this Roman centurion is the one that Jesus praises. 
Let me ask you this. Which is more remarkable? The miracle that Jesus performed of healing this man's servant? Or the admiration that Jesus had for this man's faith? Which do you think was more remarkable, the miracle or the faith? Well, there have been a lot of miracles in the Bible, but very few times did Jesus turn to anyone and say, you have a great faith. Jesus was impressed with his faith. He was so amazed. Why? Was it because this man was a man of power? No. Was it because this man had a prominent position? No. Was it because he was a leader of men? No. Was it because he's a man of authority? No. In his journey to Jesus, this centurion had some obstacles to overcome. Now, we don't know for sure how many of these he would have had, but I tell you, if I'd been in his shoes, they would have been there for me. Here's some issues I, I think he may have faced. Pride, doubt, money, language, distance, time, self-sufficiency, race, why was Jesus impressed with this man's faith? Was it because he was generous and helped the Jews build their synagogue? Uh, I think it was much more than that. Was it because uh, he was a caring man and coming on behalf of somebody else? Yes, but I think it was more than that. Was it because he turned to Jesus in his time of need? Yes, but I think it was more than that. Was it because he was humble? Yes, but I think it was more than that. Was it because he understood Jesus as a person of authority? Yes, but I think it was more than that. Keep in mind, according to this text, he came to Jesus. Though he'd never seen him, he had a great faith. He understood that Jesus was a man of authority, not of human authority but a divine authority because he could heal. He believed Jesus. He trusted Jesus. He took Jesus at his word. To him, Jesus was the object of his faith. He said, Jesus, you can do this. What about your faith? Do you believe that Jesus has authority from God. Do you trust him and take him at his word? Is Jesus the object of your faith? Our Father, we're grateful. We're grateful for Jesus and what he's done. We're grateful for who he is. The Father, we're grateful that he can live in our heart. We're grateful for the forgiveness he extends. We're grateful for what he's done to pay for the price for our sin. We're grateful that he's there to trust, that we, for us to trust in. And we're grateful for the hope we have in eternity. But Lord, may we have great faith. Too often I feel, Father, like the man who said, I believe, but help my unbelief. Help us to trust you completely and implicitly. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand as we sing? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ.
Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And before John takes off, Dina, would you, I mean, uh, Tina, would you come up here for just a moment? I have a baptismal certificate for you. I've already signed it. There's a place for somebody else to sign this witness, and you get to pick who that might be. Okay? And we're grateful you can be here. These are part of your family, and if you need any help, just look around and find somebody that would be willing to help you, especially if it's the middle of the night, to give them a call. Yeah. Uh, but we're grateful to have you. Thank you very much. Good morning. The Lord's Supper is called the Last Supper for a reason. It was. Now this was the last meal Jesus and his disciples shared prior to his crucifixion. Jesus' death occurred very shortly thereafter. So this meal was a memorial of sorts, even though the people attending the dinner did not fully grasp the significance. The group gathered there that evening had questions. They were confused, uncertain, Doubtful, fearful, and anxious. Death was in the air. Praise be to God that today when we gather around the Eucharist table, it is a commemoration, a celebration, not a memorial. The Greek meaning of Eucharist is thanksgiving, and thankful is exactly what we are when we gather together. A part of this observance includes vividly recalling Jesus hanging on that cross so we can have salvation and forgiveness, absolved of sin. But another part of this observance is remembrance of a resurrected, vibrantly alive Christ. And because of that, he joins us here. In at least one way, we are different from the twelve disciples. For when we share this meal with Jesus, it is with certainty, complete understanding, assurance, answers, and peace. Now let us declare with absolute certainty today that Jesus stands with us at this table. And at, as this significant time comes to a close, may we be able to say, we know he is living. We have just seen Jesus. Bow with me, please. Lord. We take the time to remember your great sacrifice for our sins. We remember your broken body and shed blood, not for anything you did wrong, but because you were paying the penalty for our sins. Before we take this bread and drink this cup this morning, we repent of any sins we have committed before you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. It's good to see everyone here today. and. As we prepare to take communion, we'll sing uh, this, I believe, as our song. And uh, as uh, the diaconate come forward and release everyone by the rows to come up and partake of the communion, uh, we'll leave the sanctuary afterwards. And uh, you're invited to join us for refreshments. We thank those online for joining us today. And we thank you for coming today also. <laughs>